Because president is not the my business what religious color anybody wears. In ITT, in Concord, in RCN, in Summit Oil, in the bakeries, in the bookshop, in the presses. And so we, we employ people purely on merit. Round pegs in round holes. Period. In the wake of the just concluded February 2023 general elections, and the emergence of Ashiwaju Bola Hamed Tinubu as winner, although the results are still being contested in court, some analysts have asked if Tinubu's win will not go the way of MKO Abiola's win in 1993. Especially considering the fact that, apart from being from the same pro-democracy background as Abiola, and a close confidant of the late business Magu, and one who fought the military to a standstill as a member of a defunct Nadeko movement. Tinubu modeled this campaign after and even took Abiola's slogan. Who was Abiola? What really transpired in 1993? What forces thwarted his dream of ruling Nigeria? How did that affect the fortunes of the country? And are those forces that thwarted his dream still at work today? Moshud Kashimao Olawale Abiola, popularly known as MKO Abiola, was born on the 24th day of August in the year 1937. He was a Nigerian businessman, publisher, and a politician. He was the 14th Aure on the Kakanfo of Yoruba land and an aristocrat of a backland of Ogun State in Nigeria. MKO ran for Nigeria's presidency in 1993, following which the election results were annulled by the preceding military regime of his close friend, General Ibrahim Badamoshi Babangida, who insisted that the elections were corrupt and unfair, even though the generality of Nigerians unanimously at the time agreed that the elections were the freest and fairest in Nigeria's history to date. It is true that the presidential election was generally seen to be free, fair, and peaceful. However, there was in fact a huge array of electoral practices virtually in all the states of the Federation before the actual voting began. MKO died in General Sani Abacha's detention on July 7, 1998, exactly a month after Abacha himself died and was awarded the GCFR posthumously on the 6th of June 2018 by General Buhari. On the same day, June 12 was named Nigeria's Democracy Day by the same Buhari regime. On this episode of our Unspoken History series, we focus on events surrounding Abiola's death. Abiola's death on July 7, 1998 remains a mystery. And like most modern political mysteries, it has inspired numerous conspiracy theories ranging from assassination by the military junta to neutralization in service of northern interest. But the most lasting of those conspiracies puts Abiola's blood on the hands of a foreign body, the United States of America's foremost espionage unit, the Central Intelligence Agency. The circumstances surrounding Abiola's unofficial victory in the 1993 presidential elections and his refusal to accept General Babangida's annulment of the election led to a political crisis which attracted keen attention of foreign governments, including America. And this was a time when African dictators feared the United States and African citizens themselves still believe in the self-assigned role of Western governments to promote democracy, good governance, and human rights in the so-called developing country. The argument was that America was intent on ending the crisis by putting a completely permanent end to Nigeria's democratic impasse that had ensued as a result of Abiola's refusal to accept the annulment and Abacha's refusal to step aside as military president. The belief that Abiola was killed by the United States was further reinforced following the release of Susan Rice's memoir, the woman who served the late Abiola the now infamous cup of tea moments before he died. 
At the time, Rice was the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs under the Bill Clinton administration and was visiting Nigeria and the late MQ Abiola as part of America's efforts to assist Nigeria negotiate a transition to democracy after General Bacha's death. She infamously poured Abiola a cup of tea around the time he got into a coughing fit that later led to his death. Susan Rice had been widely regarded as the person the CIA sent to poison Abiola. Some time ago, former Minister of Aviation, Mr. Femi Fanikayode, described Susan Rice as an operative and enforcer of the CIA and a dangerous spy her entire career. Following rumors that she was going to be then Vice President Joe Biden's running mate, FFK then went on to castigate Susan for her perceived role in the murder of MK Wabiola in 1998. In her autobiography, Rice tried to set the record straight. According to her, she met Abiola on that fateful day purely on diplomatic grounds, alongside other members of the U.S. delegation. Hear her awards. She insisted that the coughing intensified after this and that the doctor had to be called in to tend to him. The doctor then declared that Abiola was having a heart attack. An hour after reaching the hospital, the politician was pronounced dead. The question is, if Abiola was coughing before Rice offered to pour him some tea, do the circumstances suggest that something was amiss before the tea, and as such should deflect attention from the idea that it was served poison tea? Tea or no tea? Can anyone in good conscience claim that Abiola died of natural causes, especially considering the fact that his death came exactly a month after Abacha's? To answer these and more questions, let us take a look at a few known assassinations committed by America's CIA, reflect a little on America's record and pattern of operation across the world over time, and we will let you, the viewer, make up your mind on what to believe. The CIA's notoriety for high-profile assassinations span decades. And even though the agency often denies responsibility for most crimes it is accused of, it remains a named culprit of countless murders and coups all over the world. In fact, this notoriety led to an expansive investigation by the US Senate in the 1970s, leading the then President Gerald Ford to issue a directive in 1976 stating Of course, this was mostly to save face and make it look as though the United States government had the CIA on the leash. But the killings did not stop and hasn't stopped. The CIA's plot to kill the just ousted Prime Minister of the Democratic Republic of Congo at the time, Patrice Lumumba, is one for the books. On September 26, 1960, an American simply known as Joe arrived in Leopoldville, now Kinshasa. Joe was not there to dance Makosa. He came into the country carrying a kit that contained a poison meant to infect a target with a deadly disease similar to the kind common to the region. The poison was meant to be slipped in the food or toothpaste of the very important man, Lumumba. The CIA's interest in Lumumba's death was clear. He had a serious chance of returning to power. And if that were to happen, his pro-Soviet stance would harm America's Cold War agenda. The directive, according to the agent, came from President Dwight Eisenhower himself. Though that plan was later abandoned at the last minute, the CIA later succeeded 
when Lumumba died four months later at the hands of a local firing squad. And even though the CIA denied involvement in his death, John Stockwell, a former CIA agent, later admitted that the agents had been in touch with the killers all along, including on the very night of Lumumba's mother. Allende was the world's first democratically elected Marxist. On September 11, 1973, his dead body was pulled out from the National Palace during a U.S.-backed military coup that helped define the Cold War. With bombs raining down on the palace, witnesses claimed that Allende shot himself with an AK-47 he'd received from Fidel Castro. But years of military rule only fueled suspicions that he had been executed. At the time of his death, press reports mentioned that Allende's body had 36 bullet holes. By 1960, the United States has, had expended resources trying to salvage its imperialistic hold on Chile. However, a certain leftist politician, Salvador Allende, was promoting rhetoric that sought to turn public opinion away from America. The Americans were bent on blocking his presidential aspirations. When he ran for the presidency in 1964, the CIA funded the campaign against him with a whopping $3 million. He lost but eventually won in 1970. Before he took office, US President Richard Nixon authorized $10 million to fund his overthrow. Nixon ordered the CIA to find military officers in Chile who were willing to organize a coup. The CIA delivered cash, guns and tear gas to the officers. After the coup's failure, the CIA covered its tracks by denying connection with any of the officers. However, it continued to track potential coup plotters who could be recruited. Allende was overthrown in 1973, leading to his eventual death. Even though the CIA, as usual, denied involvement, Secretary of State Henry revealed in a private conversation later that America was not particularly fond of Castro, and it made this fact known. According to the Cuban leader, perhaps with some exaggeration, the CIA made a total of 634 assassinations attempt on his life. And those attempts give a clear example of the length America would go in a bid to eliminate its perceived enemies. In 1960, the CIA poisoned the box of Castro's favorite cigars with a toxin that was strong enough to kill anyone who as much as put one of the cigars in his mouth. No one knew exactly what happened to the cigars. Perhaps there was a mix-up because the cigars never got to Castro. Desperate to eliminate Castro, the CIA moved to work with two gangsters on the FBI's most wanted list, providing them with six liter pills. It is suspected that the person who was to present the pills to Castro later developed cold feet. In 1959, the CIA recruited Castro's lover, Marita Lawrence, to assassinate him. She was given two pills to put in his drink. Each pill could, could kill in 30 seconds. However, Lawrence made an error in judgment by stashing the pills in a cold cream jar that turned them unusable. Another CIA plot against Castro came in 1963 when agents planned to use a hypodermic needle concealed within a pen. This pen was to be presented to Castro by a highly placed Cuban officer whom he trusted. However, John F. Kennedy's assassination put the plans on hold as the CIA directed its attention elsewhere. In the height of the Cold War, the West became very interested in Iraq. It had been a bit relaxed as the country was ruled by a Ashmanite monarchy installed by Britain at the end of World War I. However, this monarchy was overthrown in 1958 by General Kwasin, who had little regard for Britain and America. The Western powers suspected it was aligned with the Iraqi Communist Party and became increasingly agitated. This reached ahead when it withdrew from the Baghdad Pact, a clearly anti-Soviet alliance backed by Americans. So the CIA worked covertly with the rival Ba'ath Party to plot against him. With a young Saddam Hussein 
leading the operation, gunmen ambushed Kwasin on a street in Baghdad in 1959. However, Hussein missed and Kwasin narrowly escaped. The CIA strengthened his alliance with the Ba'at Party and agreed to consolidate his support for the coup plotters as long as they committed to murder all the country's communist and leftist allies. A second attempt to overthrow Qasim succeeded in February 1963. He was executed afterwards. Hussein would assume power as leader of Iraq only to be murdered by the same America years later on trump up charges of him amassing we weapons of mass destruction. I can go on and on, but let us leave these examples here for now. We shall maximize the nation's return from oil by turning over future investment to the private sector and by removing the complex structures which makes NMPC's accountability and assessment of efficiency almost impossible. You see, there are so many layers upon layers built on this simple thing crude oil. I don't even know whether it's oil or some mystery around it that is taking the money from the central bank. The examples I've mentioned and America's pattern of operations proves that while the U.S. put much thought to its assassination plots, the strategies are often executed in ways that allow the agency plausible deniability, especially when conducted remotely enough to be able to credibly deny involvement. Whether it is by sending locals to do their bidding or secretly backing coups, the CIA has a long history of hiding behind the scenes. But in the case of Ab Abiola, some analysts have argued that it hardly makes any sense that the smartest thing would be for the US to get three senior members of his government to offer Abiola poison tea in the presence of witnesses. They say this is simply not the way the CIA kills. But this argument will make sense until one realizes that analysts have accused the same US of sending intel to the Babangida government prior to the 1993 presidential elections, giving him reasons why the elections should not hold. They say had Abiola been allowed to govern Nigeria, the country would have taken its rightful place as the true giant of Africa and the leader of the black world, something they say the West is dead scared of. In his interest exactly, is an insecure Nigeria, underdeveloped Nigeria where nothing works and yet is plagued with terrorism and oil theft in the Niger Delta. Imagine for one moment that the most populous country in Africa and the most populous black nation on earth is corruption free, enjoys a thriving homegrown democracy in which leaders mean well and are ready not only to stake their necks for their people but to also negotiate patriotic international trade deals with the West on behalf of its people. Imagine what glory awaits the country in such a situation. Do you honestly suppose that the West will favor a man who was not only reported to have asked for reparation from the West for hundreds of years of theft and looting, but is also set to initiate the process for that kind of change? Reflect on these questions for now until we meet again in our next episode of Doppler Films on Spoken History series. If you've enjoyed this video and like to see more content like this, Please help support our growth by giving a thumbs up, subscribing to our YouTube channel, following our various social media handles, and please do send us a little donation to help us continue making more content like this.